In chapter one, we explored what constitutes reality and the imagination. We defined important concepts such as truth and falsifiability. Additionally, we studied how the imagination can play tricks with the perception of reality. In the extreme case, erroneously convincing many that imaginary ideas are a part of reality. In this chapter, we will continue our search for the truth by evaluating methods that help us look for it. In particular, we will look at science and what sets it apart from other such methods. We will compare science and religion. Are the two similar, or are they very different? We will also consider the role of evidence and answer the question: What constitutes acceptable evidence? And what does not? Hi, I am John the Prophet. These are incredible times. Some of our activities were practically unimaginable only a generation ago. For instance, we travel across oceans on board commercial aircraft, far above weather, covering vast distances at great speeds. While traversing some 10 miles a minute, we casually sip on beverages, hammer away on laptops at times entirely oblivious to the brutal elements that prevail outside, only a few inches away. The comfort of the warm, near sea level quality air inside the cabin is deceptive. Between it and a serious combination of hypothermia, hypoxia, gastrointestinal decompression. Pulmonary passage blockage and other threats is a thin layer of aluminum, insulation, and decorative plastics. But most people don't even think about it because the comfort inside gives the impression of a safe and secure environment. It makes us complacent. While complaining about the food or the size of our seat. We take it for granted that we can jump on board an airplane whenever we want, and travel thousands of miles in a matter of hours. We call loved ones using wireless telephone technology. We send messages and even images and videos instantly from one continent to the next using electronic devices smaller than a deck of cards. While complaining that the signal isn't strong enough, or that we dropped a call, we take it for granted that we can call anybody on a moment's notice and express what is on our minds. We jump into our cars and travel reliably and comfortably, protected from the elements. The bite of the winter's cold or the burn of a sizzling summer sun is remedied by a climate control unit, standard equipment in any car. While driving thousands of miles every year, we complain about the price of gas or the flow of traffic, but we take it for granted that we can jump into our cars on a moment's notice and drive to wherever our hearts desire. These are but a few examples of modern-day technology. They are all possible thanks to science. You can also thank science for your ability to watch this or any other video. Thank science for your computer, and the internet, and practically any tool you use in the modern world. It doesn't matter where we look; the fingerprints of science are everywhere. From healthcare to transportation, from modern-day farming to national security, from the internal combustion engine to the nuclear power plant, from the lasers in our DVD players, the LCDs in our cell phones, the microprocessors in our cars, our TVs, refrigerators, dishwashers, and microwaves, the preservatives in our food, the steel in our knives, the light bulbs in our rooms. 
the paint on our walls, the shingles on our roofs, the sheets on our beds, the clothes we wear, the air conditioning in our homes, to the conversion of energy required to run and manufacture all of these. The list goes on and on. Science is everywhere. No other human activity can boast of achievements that measure up to those of science, and no other activity touches our lives in as many profound ways as does it. Just look around your room. Odds are that practically everything in your field of view can be traced to science, in one way or another. Science and technology is what drives the economic engines of all advanced nations, and each is defined by its science. But how is all of this possible? And why is it possible now? Humans have been around for a long time, so why hasn't this been possible before? What did our ancestors lack that made scientific endeavor impossible for them, but not for us? What is really the difference between us and them? Is science always good? Aren't nuclear weapons or biological warfare examples of science gone awry? All of these are great questions. And this video is intended to answer them clearly and fairly. In his 1958 paper, *The Beginnings of Rationalism*, the late philosopher Karl Popper described what historians now know about early schools. The school is the invention of early civilizations. By modern-day standards, these early schools were extremely primitive, often nothing more than ideas maintained by a group of people. However, they had a certain structure and a well-defined purpose, like their modern-day counterparts, and also very different from the modern school. Their purpose was as simple as it was unambiguous. First, the purpose was to hand on to the next generation a definite doctrine, written by its first master. Second, the purpose was to ensure the doctrine was delivered to the next generation unchanged. Additionally, since new ideas didn't come from the original master, they were considered heresies. The last one prevented these early schools from introducing any new ideas. These were simply not allowed. In fact. These schools defined stagnation. Any attempt to change the doctrine was feverishly rejected, and the instigator expelled as a heretic. However, sometimes the heretic would claim that the revised version really represented the true doctrine of its founder. He would try to convince others that he was unique as the possessor of this one true orthodoxy, and therefore the most suited as its leader. This led to objections from the flock, and would eventually spur the formation of a variation of the original doctrine. A new denomination was born. And since this idea was supported by opinions rather than fact, then who was to say it was wrong? Experience shows, no matter how ridiculous an idea, it will always attract some supporters. Interestingly, schools of this nature prevail among us today. We know them as religions. 
And while some of those have demonstrated an ability to adapt to modernity through consistent catch-up, others have simply chosen to become relics. Greek history provides an excellent example of such schools. About 500 before the Common Era, the Greek philosopher, astronomer and mathematician Pythagoras founded the Pythagorean school in Samos, Greece. The Pythagorean school of thought was dogmatic in most ways, and one of its preaching dictated that all numbers could be expressed as the ratio of certain integers. This way, one could represent the decimal number 2.5 as the ratio of the integers 5 over 2, and the decimal 1.2 as 6 over 5, or 12 over 10, and so on. Such numbers are called rational numbers because they can be formed as the ratio of two integers. One of the members of the Pythagorean school was Hippasus of Metapontum, who uncovered a violation of the Pythagorean doctrine. He demonstrated that the ratio between the diagonal and any side of a square could not be represented in this manner, using integers. He had discovered irrational numbers. The number he found is now known as the square root of 2. It shares this interesting property with other famous numbers like pi and the golden ratio. In what would strike the modern man as a surprising twist, the discovery wasn't well received by the other Pythagoreans. After all, it violated the established dogmatic wisdom of the Pythagorean school of thought, which claimed such numbers didn't exist. The idea was a heresy. The myth says the Pythagoreans promptly thanked Hippasus by attacking him and throwing him into the ocean, where he drowned. The purity of the Pythagorean doctrine was once again secure. So what important lessons can the modern man draw from the myth of Hippasus? that thinking about irrational numbers can be fatal? No, we learn that the most important difference between us and our ancestors is not in what we think, but in how we think. The Pythagoreans were arrogant about their knowledge. They were convinced they knew the truth when in fact they did not. We learn that thinking one knows the truth does not mean one really does. One's opinion is always based on the amount of information one has. But do not think you have all the information there is. A wise person recognizes that one's knowledge is limited and is ready to change the opinion associated with it upon acquiring better information. If fanatics implemented only this adjustment to their thinking, Perhaps there would not be religious wars, or inquisitions, or crusades, or religious suicide bombers, as doubt would replace the certainty of conviction required by such actions. Being intellectual is being anti-fanatic. We learn that the Pythagoreans considered their truth objective, when it was never anything but subjective. In other words, their truth was just an opinion. In the opinion of the Pythagoreans, irrational numbers didn't exist. But that opinion was incorrect. It was not supported by mathematical proofs, as Hippasus demonstrated, but only by the notion 
that this was the way things were supposed to be. An opinion is not a fact and thus should not be treated as one. There are still people around who opine the Earth is the center of the universe, or 6,000 years old, and even flat or hollow. Those opinions are no different from those of the Pythagoreans in being incorrect. We learn that while the Pythagoreans saw the truth as divine, absolute, and unchangeable, this made no difference about its truthfulness. When such a conclusion is reached about one's truth, the mind rejects the possibility it may still be false. The real search for truth ceases. Some people will continue to claim they are still searching when all they're really doing is looking for evidence to confirm their current beliefs. A part of such a search involves rejecting any evidence that refutes the old belief and clinging to anything that might restore it. It is a grasp at straws. For such people, rejecting a false belief is much harder than rejecting the evidence. These are the modern-day Pythagoreans. We learn a lot about human nature. We come to learn that many modern men are not that different from the Pythagoreans. It is human nature to want our worlds to be simple and comprehensible. We conclude we must be the center of the universe. We look for patterns in everything and try to plant human faces on things not understood. When we discover new facts that shake those notions, our reaction is often denial and rejection of the facts. Once people recognized how emotion tended to cloud one's judgment and lead to the acceptance of untruths, a very clever thinking technique was invented, especially designed to avoid such mistakes. But its use requires humility and recognition of human frailty. It requires a mind not blurred by prejudice and passion, emotion and wishful thinking. And it requires the notion of an absolute truth to be abandoned. Truth would now depend on evidence. The method has transformed our lives. It has replaced subjective truths with objective ones. In the process, our views of reality have changed forever. It is unrivaled by any other way of thinking. This is the scientific method. The Pythagoreans would never modify their thinking. It would take almost two millennia before people began to adjust their thinking before any change in our understanding of nature could set in. And it would take four additional centuries before the modern scientific method would be defined and a transformation in our quality of life would be realized. Luckily for us, schools have evolved into something far more accommodating of new ideas, at least most of them. However, to this day, a large number of people resist change and regard it as sinister. It is my hope that after watching this video, you will feel like you better understand the process of science, and that while there are reasons to tread the path of change with care, the ultimate goal of practicing science is to improve the quality of life for humanity through an understanding of nature. Science can be defined as the systematic collection of knowledge about the natural world using real and observable physical evidence. Its purpose is to provide an impartial and thus reliable description of the world in which we live. The word impartial is very important here. 
Science attempts to disregard our favorite ideologies, whatever they may be. Uncontaminated science describes reality in no uncertain terms. It doesn't care whether your worldview is atheistic or religious, political or not, whether you are rich or poor, purple or orange, or any combination thereof. It attempts to describe reality as it is, void of emotion and void of bias. The collection of knowledge takes place using the special process we call the scientific method, which works as follows. First, one or more falsifiable hypotheses are proposed to explain some natural phenomenon. Another word for hypothesis is explanation. A hypothesis is lesser than a theory and can be considered a proto-theory. Second, the hypothesis supported by the largest body of evidence eventually becomes a theory. The viewer should be mindful that a piece of evidence can support more than one hypothesis at the same time. If contradictory evidence is presented, the hypothesis is either rejected or revised so the new evidence can be explained. If time and again one hypothesis can explain new evidence better than competing hypotheses, it eventually is upgraded to a theory. However, it is always possible the theory itself will be rejected, sometime in future, on the grounds of evidence yet to be discovered. This way, a theory is not an absolute truth. Granted, it may bring us closer to the truth than we were before, but an absolute truth, it is not. From the standpoint of science, there is no such thing as an absolute truth. In this sense, it differs greatly from religions. Science is not a religious dogma. Humility is built into the method, and it assumes we may be wrong. While no one is denying some people display a dogmatic attitude toward science as if it were a religion, this reflects on human frailty and not the method itself. Third, theories for which no contradictory evidence is presented for extended periods of decades or even centuries are recognized as laws of nature or principles. Examples include evolution by natural selection, Newton's principle of gravitational attraction, and Einstein's theory of relativity. These principles are so well supported by evidence, they are now considered fact. It must be emphasized that these laws describe what nature does, and are not laws in the sense they rule it. Nature rules us. It is not the other way around. As a simple example of how this might play out in reality, consider the quasi-scientific investigation of some crime. At some point in time, there may be three suspects to a crime. Call them A, B, and C. Each suspect is really a competing hypothesis or explanation of the crime. We may have a single piece of evidence that implicates all three. We may have three pieces of evidence that implicates two of them, say B and C. And we may have two more pieces of evidence that implicates only one of them, C. Clearly that suspect is most likely as the perpetrator and can thus be considered the theory among the three competing hypotheses. We must make it abundantly clear that not all collection of knowledge is scientific. For instance, collecting knowledge about one's favorite sports team or athlete is not science, because sports are not science. It is a form of entertainment. Some would call it a distraction. 
Collecting knowledge about astrology is not science either, because astrology is not science. It too is an entertainment activity. It is a religion. Science only considers natural processes. This simple fact is surprisingly hard for many to comprehend. For this reason, it bears repeating: science only considers natural processes. Activities that assume the involvement of the supernatural are, by definition, not science, because science only considers natural processes. For this reason, creationism is not science, because it assumes the involvement of a god. It is a religion. Evolution, on the other hand, only assumes natural processes. It is a science. In science, hypotheses and theories are never proven. Instead, they are rejected by the evidence. As stated earlier, theories not rejected by the evidence prevail. This approach prevents a serious logical fallacy from taking place, in which a single piece of evidence would suffice to establish an entire theory. Just consider the previous example of the crime. It should be clear that if we only use the first piece of evidence to establish our theory, and ignore the rest, there is no way to know with confidence who the perpetrator is. Thus, we need to gather as much evidence as possible to build up this confidence. No scientific theory makes it far without substantial quantities of supporting evidence. As a consequence, science is dynamic. Hypotheses that prevail today may be rejected tomorrow by evidence yet to be discovered. This vibrancy is more than people who have been indoctrinated in authoritative thinking style can take. Some of them will say derisively, "Well, they are always changing things in science. They can never make up their minds." These are people who do not understand what science is, and do not understand that this is where science draws its strength. It gives it a tool to weed out nonsense, which would and does stick in the authoritative thinking framework. The education system has failed these people by not explaining to them adequately how science works. In science, one approaches a question with an open mind and intellectual humility. One goes where the data takes one. Lay people often misunderstand the phrase "the evidence rejects the hypothesis" and take it to mean an absolute rejection only. In science, its meaning actually ranges from an absolute rejection, as represented in the phrase "the evidence rejects the hypothesis of intelligent design," to a partial rejection, which happens when an existing hypothesis or theory is improved. As an example, consider Newton's three laws of motion, first proposed in 1687. In 1916, Albert Einstein demonstrated Newton's laws do not work for objects moving close to the speed of light. His fix was the general theory of relativity. Although his work technically supersedes Newton's work, it also demonstrates that when moving far below the speed of light. Einstein's formulation reduces to Newton's formulation. From a certain point of view, relativity effectively rejected Newton's laws of motion. But from another perspective, relativity simply improved his laws. Listen to what she's going to say. This is very key. This is very key. God watches over your word to perform it in. I'm sorry. Watches over His word in your mouth to perform it. Listening to the problem, yes, there is no negative department in heaven. So if you... yes, it is key to listen to this woman. There is no negative department in heaven, she claims. But how does she know? Where does Linda Markovich get her information from? I want to know. Has she ever been to heaven? Why does she pretend she knows what is, or is not in heaven?
Let's be clear about this. Heaven is not a real place, but a figment of the imagination. For this reason, if the idea appeals to you, you can imagine it to be whatever you want, with or without departments. The imagination submits to no rule, and no one's rule. Linda simply spews out her thoughts without thinking them through. Her rant is emotional, irrational, and intellectually shallow. However, armed with self-righteous certitude, she and her sidekick move to force their version of heaven down people's throats. And sadly, credulous viewers absorb this unsubstantiated drivel without a question. Unfortunately, such nonsense is not limited to Linda. It is generally the trademark of faith, and it invites disrespect and ridicule. And this is the difference between science and religion. Science is contemplative and rational. Religion is unreflective and emotional. It is irrational. The religious would be better off by changing their tone to one that lacks certainty, in the same way it lacks evidence. Linda's nonsense would be better stated as, "I believe there is no negative department in heaven," and she might be rewarded with indifference rather than derision. We will only consider one additional property of science: the requirements that must be satisfied by any scientific hypothesis. These requirements were first stipulated in 1934 by Karl Popper in his book *Logik der Forschung*, *The Logic of Scientific Discovery*. Dr. Popper put forth his idea of potential falsifiability as a way to separate science from non-science. First, the phenomenon must be repeatable. Imagine we perform an experiment that involves dropping golf balls to the ground. Each time one is released, we expect it to fall to the ground. It doesn't matter what time of the day or who is watching, or what country it takes place in. The phenomenon always manifests itself. Scientific hypotheses only apply to repeatable phenomena. Second, you must be able to observe the phenomenon, either directly or indirectly, using any of our sensory organs. Here we can clearly observe the golf balls falling using our eyes. Scientific hypotheses only apply to observable phenomena. Third, it must be possible to reject the hypothesis if it is not supported by evidence. This can only be done if it is falsifiable. Scientific hypotheses must be falsifiable. Fourth. Any piece of evidence must be authentic, which of course means not fake. It may strike the viewer as strange that something so obvious is even brought up, but unfortunately, the history of science is plentiful of swindlers and scam artists that have tried to convince the masses their favorite activity possesses scientific merit by faking or willfully misinterpreting evidence. We must remember that while the scientific method is self-correcting, and such cheats are eventually exposed, they can temporarily blindside even the most astute of us. To minimize such risks, peer reviewing is employed, but it is a process in which evidence and hypotheses are thoroughly scrutinized by other experts, and while certainly not perfect, is the best error-checking method known to man. A segment of the population holds the view that science and religion complement each other, and both are good for society. Others disagree and claim there is a conflict between the two worldviews. Many of those consider religion harmful and favor science, while for others the opposite holds true. Are such views justified? Chapter three will discuss the so-called conflict argument in detail. 
But at this time, it is prudent to ponder the question: What is the difference between the two? In particular, how do these two differ as thinking processes? Let's consider this in some detail. In short, religion and science are two fundamentally different thinking processes. In religion, assertions are believed in the absence of evidence. In science, in contrast, assertions are believed because of evidence. Religion is driven by faith, which is a belief in inspiration, revelation, and authority. Science is driven by rationality, which is a belief based on reason or evidence. Rational thinking takes place when we use logic and reason to support our thoughts and ideas. In contrast, irrational thinking takes place in the absence of such logic, when we allow emotions, prejudices, and personal opinions to direct our thinking. In science, one begins with a question and then tries to reach a conclusion using evidence and reason. In religion, on the other hand, and as experience shows. The process is one of defense. One starts with a conclusion and then tries to discredit any evidence and reason that refutes it. Of course, when called out on this, some people of faith will accuse the observer of being shallow and intolerant of faith. However, such claims are simply absurd and are rooted in sensitivity and denial. In science, there is no such thing as an absolute truth. While we think our current knowledge is closer to the truth than our previous knowledge, an ultimate truth is considered unachievable. In religion, there is absolute truth. There is no need for further search. This satisfies the need of many people to have firm answers to questions like, "Is there life after death?" The true answer is we don't know conclusively. But as discussed in Chapter One, science says it is very unlikely. That answer is not acceptable to those who find life should last forever. To them, the uncertainty is better quenched with a preferred answer, one that is wholly constructed by the imagination. Science rejects hypotheses that don't have supporting evidence. In religion. There is no need to hypothesize. To the faithful, the truth is already known. Science exercises intellectual humility because it presumes our knowledge is not absolute. Religion exercises intellectual arrogance because it presumes our knowledge is indeed absolute. However, thinking one knows does not mean one actually does. Pretending to know that with certainty, which is impossible to know for sure. Is intellectually arrogant. People who claim with certainty that gods do or do not exist display intellectual arrogance. They simply do not know. If they knew, it would no longer be faith. Science attempts to describe how nature works, while religions describe our purpose in nature. However, that premise is seriously flawed, as there is no evidence in nature other than our subjective senses to indicate a purpose in the first place. A group of people presuming a universal importance is as delusional as a colony of bacteria on a grain of sand presuming importance over all the beaches of this world. People who contend the entire universe. With all its billions and billions of galaxies, each containing many hundreds of billions of suns, like ours, was created by a fatherly being, who not only created it for them, but has now turned his primary interest toward their puny, petty, personal problems, can only be described as juvenile narcissistic lunatics. You are simply not that important. Science has a deep explanatory power. Religion has a very limited one. Suppose I showed you my friend Tom lazing around in his newly invented levitation patio chair. Suppose he was hovering some ten feet above the ground while sipping on a cool tropical beverage and 
enjoying the sun. You would probably ask, how did he do it? How does it work? Would an answer like, well, Tom did it, be satisfactory to you? Would it reveal to you the inner workings of the chair? Would it explain the laws of physics that made this possible? The answer is no. It would not explain anything. And yet, this is the kind of answer the religious would have us accept when it comes to explaining nature. Science is unbiased. Uncontaminated science describes the world the way it appears. Religion is absolutely biased. Even in its most modest form, religion is always biased towards the god or gods it professes to represent. Religion cannot describe reality without bias, and therefore, the religious description of reality cannot be trusted. Islam describes the world from the standpoint of Muslims, Christianity from the standpoint of Christians, and so on. The problem is that Muslims don't like the Christian viewpoint, and Christians don't like the Muslim viewpoint, and the rest of us dislike both of theirs. Only science can describe the world in a balanced way that does not promote the Muslim or Christian views above anybody else's, and vice versa. And finally, the story science tells us about the natural world is entirely based on the evidence we can observe around us. This story is enthralling. It is a story arrived at from many different angles, told by many different scientific disciplines. Cosmology, astronomy, geology, biology, paleontology, chemistry, nuclear physics, and many others give a comprehensive, compelling, and coherent explanation as to how the universe appears to have come into existence, how our solar system formed, and how life on Earth may have begun and evolved into the diverse flora and fauna of which we are an integral part. Religion, on the other hand, simply does not provide a matching answer. Its only offer is wishful thinking about how things ought to be, according to ancient texts written by people whose understanding of nature would have made a modern-day third grader look like a Nobel Prize recipient. Its explanatory power is limited to God did it. The adjective rational is used to describe an action based on reason rather than emotion. From the standpoint of logic, it is rational to believe a proposition to be true if it is supported by observable physical evidence. Such evidence renders it rational to believe gravity actually exists or that liquid water can turn into ice. By the same token, it is irrational to believe a proposition not supported by evidence to be true. It is irrational to believe the being known as Santa Claus is real, as there is no valid evidence to support his existence. Stories and movies about Santa, as well as portly men in red and white costumes boasting white beards and pretending to be him, is not acceptable as evidence, no matter how jolly. The lack of evidence renders it rational to believe Santa Claus is not real, but imaginary. Religions tell us God's existence must be accepted by faith because of lack of evidence. For instance, Hebrews 11.1 1 states, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The following definition of faith is found in the New Catholic Dictionary. 
In general, faith is an assent of the mind to the truth of some proposition on the word of another, God or man. It differs from assent in matters of science in that the latter is based on evidence of fact, whereas the former is based solely on the word of another. And the modern Catholic dictionary defines faith as follows. The acceptance of the word of another, trusting that one knows what the other is saying and is honest in telling the truth. The basic motive of all faith is the authority or right to be believed of someone who is speaking. Religious faith is belief in the absence of evidence. It follows that religious faith is inherently irrational. In the interest of fairness, it should be stressed that religions attempt to define faith in a more sophisticated manner than just believe in the absence of evidence. However, the meaning of the word is inseparable from the activity. Faith means belief without evidence. And it doesn't matter whether the faith is in the natural or supernatural. It is the absence of evidence that makes it irrational. Irrationality is considered by most to be a negative attribute. For this reason, many religious apologists adamantly reject that their faith is irrational, as this would reflect poorly on it. Instead, they contend their faith is rational. This strikes one as a pretentious attempt at having one's cake and eating it too. Believing that angels and demons and devils and gods are real beings is not rational, but irrational. We may just as well pretend water is wine. What is evidence? What about eyewitness accounts or written stories? Do these constitute good reliable evidence? Why not? Why do standards of evidence have to be so strict? It shouldn't surprise anyone that not all evidence is created equal. Evidence can be defined as the particulars that satisfy the burden of proof. Welcome to New Hampshire. A site in the first. The burden of proof is often a point of contention between debaters, and therefore it is necessary to address it briefly. Generally, claims fall into two classes, positive and negative. A positive claim asserts something exists, while a negative one claims something does not exist. A claim like, there are raisins in the pudding, is positive, whereas the claim, there are no raisins in the pudding, is negative. What is interesting about the two is that the level of difficulty in providing evidence is not the same. It is harder to obtain evidence for a negative claim than a positive one. While eating our pudding, we would only have to find a single raisin to demonstrate the truthfulness of the positive claim. However, we would have to consume the entire pudding to demonstrate that there are no raisins to be found and this constitutes greater effort. Any claim can be negated, in other words, made positive or negative. An example of such a negation is when we convert a claim like there are raisins in the pudding into no, there are no raisins in the pudding, or vice versa. 
since any claim can be negated and it is easier to demonstrate its truthfulness in the positive form, it follows that using that version is a far more reasonable approach. We don't want to make the search for the truth harder than necessary. Suppose my friend John claims there are pink elephants flying around in my kitchen, but his wife Katie states, no, there are no pink elephants flying in the kitchen. Which of them should carry the burden of proof, John or Katie? Well, the problem is this. If John is correct, there should be evidence to support his claim. However, if Katie is correct, there will be no evidence at all. It is therefore impossible to expect her to find what does not exist. For instance, she could always state, well, I have looked for evidence and not found any. Therefore, I conclude there are no pink elephants flying in the kitchen. For that reason, the burden of proof becomes John's responsibility. Suppose John now claimed God exists, while his wife Katie stated God does not exist. Based on the aforementioned, the burden of proof is unequivocally on John and not Katie. Now, this begs the question, are there any instances when a negative claim would carry the burden of proof? The answer is indeed yes. Consider the claim, the earth is not round. There is wealth of evidence to demonstrate it is false and the earth is indeed round. This evidence has been in existence for a long time. Therefore, it is the responsibility of the proponents of that claim to educate themselves about this evidence and then demonstrate why it is not valid and provide evidence that supports their claim. It goes without saying that to date, the proponents of a flat or hollow or 6,000-year-old earth have failed to do this convincingly.